Welcome, everybody. My name is Thomas Groff. I'm one of the creators of Cilium. I'm also um, co-founder of iSurveillance, a company we created around Cilium. Today, this session is on the history of Cilium. When did we start it? Why did we start it? And so on. So let's jump right in. So first of all, what is Cilium? And most of you probably already have a good understanding of that. So I literally only have one slide on this in case somebody has never heard about Cilium. Cilium is a CNCF project. It is at incubation stage. It is providing networking, security, observability, service mesh, ingress, gateway API now. Um, and it's doing so primarily using eBPF. Whenever we can, we use eBPF and we'll get to the story why we do that. And sometimes we also use the Envoy proxy in particular if we operate at layer seven. Cilium is widely deployed today across many, many different end users. And you'll see a subset of logos on here who are all the end users out there that are utilizing Cilium. There's actually a long list of Cilium users in the GitHub repository where you can find details on who is using Cilium, why they're using Cilium, and what they're using Cilium for. Initially, I will get to the, to the details of that. Cilium was created by iSurveillant or by engineers who later created iSurveillant. We then donated Cilium to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so Cilium is today owned by the CNCF. We, of course, um, have a variety of contributors that are not from iSurveillance, so the, the set of contributors and, and uh, people working on Cilium is very diverse today. At the foundation of Cilium is eBPF, and as we go through the history of Cilium, you will see that this actually played a major role. In fact, eBPF is the reason why we created Cilium. It's even more extreme. We actually continued working on eBPF for about a year to get eBPF to the point where we could actually get started to build Cilium. So it's actually fair to say that we saw eBPF, we saw the potential, we continued developing it and uh, making progress on it. And then about a year later, we're finally at the point where we could use eBPF to build what we envisioned in terms of uh, Cilium. So what is this eBPF technology? And some of you may have seen a slide similar to this, right? eBPF is this ability to make a Linux kernel and now also a Windows kernel programmable, right? So eBPF makes the Linux kernel programmable in a secure and efficient way. We can run programs or we can write programs and we can attach them to the Linux kernel and execute them when, th when certain, certain things happen in the Linux kernel. For example, when a process or an application makes a system call or when a network packet is being received or transmitted and so on. If you want to boil it down to kind of one sentence that makes somewhat sense to most people, it is what JavaScript is to the browser, eBPF is to the Linux kernel. JavaScript also makes the browser programmable, eBPF makes the Linux kernel programmable. Out conceptually the same, the implementation and the performance and all of this is obviously very, very, very different. But if we take a just slightly deeper look, on the left, you have like a JavaScript program, and typically you would do something like this, where you would, this is obviously very simplified, but you would run a bunch of code when a website user clicks on the submit button. That's obviously one of the, the first use cases that JavaScript ever solved. Run some code when you submit a form. This is very similar for eBPF. We have a, an operating system, and we have a process and application. When the process makes a system call, for example, in this case, the access system call, exec system call, we can run an eBPF program when that happens. And the program looks very different. You see on the right side, pseudo C code, so C code like eBPF code. And on the left side, of course, uh, JavaScript. So conceptually quite similar. And they've also unlocked a, a, like a, a, a similar amount of innovation. Of course, the level and the, the, the system level they, they operate at is widely, widely different. Well, let's get to Cilium. So why did we create Cilium? Why did we create so many different projects around Cilium? Because Cilium is not just one project. There's of course the CNI, which I guess most of you have heard about before. This is the best known Cilium project. It is what provides Kubernetes or container networking. Highly scalable, highly secure, high performance, can power Kubernetes networking and beyond. 
Of course, we have Cilium Service Mesh, which, which elevates Cilium to operate at layer seven and implements a sidecar free service mesh, as well as a full conformant ingress controller and as well a gateway API implementation. And of course, many of you have heard about Hubble, the network observability layer of Cilium. Uh, it needs Cilium underneath to run and then provides extensive uh, observability functionality with nice Grafana dashboards, Prometheus metrics, and so on. And then lastly, Tetragon, the security observability and runtime enforcement layer that operates with Cilium, but you can run it completely independent of Cilium CNI as well. What connects all of these projects together again is eBPF. They're all eBPF based and they are all leverage eBPF to the most extent. So we've built all of these projects essentially to exploit the powers of eBPF. So let's go back and actually look at the origins of Cilium. When did we start it? Why did we start it? What was the vision? This was the founding team all the way back. This is actually the first ever Cilium Design Summit at a place called Diabolezza in Switzerland. It's high up in the mountains. Uh, the weather was not really great. You see the founding team here, Andre Martins, Daniel Borkman, Madhu Chala, and myself. I took the pictures. I was not in the picture itself. Um, we essentially did kind of a social, a social expedition into the mountains as a team, as a team activity while we were designing the first version of uh, Solium. And it was in this moment when we realized that observability probably matters as well because the visibility was absolutely horrendous. So that was the founding team all the way back in 2016 when we wrote the first lines of Solium code. And this was the, the, the original vision, very, very basic, very, very sim simple. Um, Kubernetes was already uh, on the rise, but back then there was also Docker. So we actually had both Docker and Kubernetes support and treated them equally. And in this initial um, phase, we focused exclusively on networking, container networking and layer three, layer four load balancing. And we had a very clear vision in mind we want to be intent so there's obviously there's a typo in the in the in the slide here intent and identity based we want it to be high performance and of course also scalable and really focus on container networking around this time 2016 essentially a lot of the industry was moving away or moving forward from OpenStack and virtualization and containers and Docker and Kubernetes were rising very, very quickly. And it became clear that the existing solutions would not scale to the demands of containers. And I see a question, does Cilium Service Mesh work on layer two or three or using layer seven? So Cilium will operate all the way from layer two to layer seven. It mostly operates on layer three, layer four. It can also operate on layer two. So we can, for example, do multicast at L2. We can do ARP path through and things like this. And we all can also operate at layer seven. So really we work across the entire what's called LC layer uh, schema. Going forward, this is the first time we actually talked about Cilium. So it was at LinuxCon 2016 in Toronto. We positioned a Cilium as a fast IPv6 container networking with BPF and XDP. In fact, it was actually uh, IPv only in the first version. So we didn't even implement IPv4 support at all, only IPv6. There was no concept of networking. We, we were sure that we can provide networking connectivity without requiring our end users to even understand what is the subnet and so on. And we already had policy or network security decoupled from the, from, from the other thing. So that's the identity-based security. And it was a giant flat L3 network, which today we take for granted. But back then, that was actually a relatively new concept. And this basic architecture that you see on here, that's still how Cilium operates today to the most extent. It's a little bit more complicated today, but that foundation is still in place today. Fast forward just a little bit. What was the next kind of problem we tackled and took on? Well, network security. At, uh, at layer three to layer seven. So we not only built a firewall that was able to do container network policy enforcement, so segmentation or network firewalling, we did that not only on the network level, but inclusive of layer seven with support for HTTP, Kafka, gRPC, and so on. And we also built in encryption using initially 
IPsec to transparently encrypt all of the network traffic. So that was essentially our network security 1.0. And that was the initial bigger feature sets of Cilium. That actually led us to the famous DockerCon 2017 talk. This was the first really, really big um, conference talk we've done. DockerCon 2017 in general was really, really big. This is also where Kubernetes really got started. So Cilium and Kubernetes share quite a bit of history there. There was this infamous um, Star Wars themed demo that a lot of people have seen. Many, many Cilium users uh, actually uh, refer back to this moment, to this DockerCon talk when they first heard about uh, so this talk is still available on YouTube if you want to have a look. It was essentially showcasing networking, container networking with Docker and network security layer 3 to layer 7, as well as encryption. This is also when we actually founded iSurveillant, the company. So we started iSurveillant about a year after creating Cilium. And you can see here, we got our first office. See one of our, our leading engineers uh, um, ironing uh, the kind of a, a, a KubeCon back wall that we took back to the office. And we also celebrated Andre's birthday here. We actually created the Cilium logo uh, because it was actually slightly different before. It was roundish. Some of you might actually um, remember uh, the, the old Cilium logo. So we, we, redid, we redid it and used kind of a more hexagon type shape, which everybody uh, recognizes as the Cilium logo today. The next bigger integration step was Hubble. And Hubble it provided um, the network observability part. This is a this was completely new. Like network observability was kind of an was kind of an afterthought in general. Like there was not a lot of observability back then. Typically, the only option you had was to go back and run TCP dump, right? Like go in and run TCP dump on the node and somehow figure out like what's going on. And that was just horrible for container networking and Kubernetes in particular at larger scale. That was a complete no go. So we built Hubble. And Hubble can run in the Kubernetes cluster and it can see all the network, all the network activity. It can provide so-called flow logs. What are the packets? What is what where are they flowing? What is being dropped? Why are things being dropped? It can also collect metrics. So it can also understand how much traffic is flowing, how many DNS requests are failing, what is the HTTP request response latency, and so on. And this really allows to troubleshoot. This is also when we built an, an additional feature into the network security layer, the SIM or the SIM integration, where we could take network observability data and extract the security relevant portion and feed that into an SIM where the security team can query it. 2018, we continued to grow. This is, I think, is at KubeCon, if I um, remember correctly. We also celebrated uh, 2K stars. And of course, we didn't celebrate the 2K flat. We had to wait until we had uh, 2048. Of course, we are hardcore engineers after all, right? This was 20, 20, 2018. And this already felt amazing. And like, wow, this is blowing up. This is, this is amazing. Shortly after, we built Cluster Mesh. And Cluster Mesh is the ability to mesh multiple Kubernetes clusters together while preserving all of the existing features, network security, network observability, and so on. And while also introducing what's called global services, where you can do load balancing across multiple clusters. So we have been extending our reach east-west. So we, instead of just being able to handle a single cluster, all of a sudden we could handle multiple clusters. We actually presented this back in 2018 at KubeCon, where we, for the first time, demoed a Kubernetes cluster running in Google Cloud and a Kubernetes cluster running in AWS, how to mesh them together uh, across multiple VPCs. Of course, the Swiss culture uh, was always in the picture as well. This is a picture from um, uh, a fondue, which is a national dish in Switzerland. Uh, we did in an Airbnb in Palo Alto with the with the team. So the, the roots in the Swiss mountains, uh, it has always been preserved. And you will see a couple of pictures later on. Uh, we keep coming back to our Swiss roots. And of course, fondue or Swiss dish is not good enough. There's also a lot of uh, skiing that is going on. This is actually an offsite with, with the team a couple of years later on where we all went uh, skiing. And on the lower side, you can see a nice uh, picture of the city of Zurich where we had a nice dinner uh, and enjoyed the view over beautiful Zurich. 2021, 
couple of years fast forward, things started to get really, really, really crazy. This is when Cilium joined the CNCF in the cloud native network category. It is also the year when Google picked Cilium as the new default networking layer for both GKE and Antos, as well as Amazon picked um, Cilium for EKS Anywhere, the on-prem offering of the managed Kubernetes platform that AWS offers, EKS A. So this was actually a big year and we were like, wow, this is really, really insane. Like this, things are going really great. Everybody started to use uh, Cilium um, and there was a lot of, a, a lot of excitement. Uh, one year later, things got even crazier. As a company, we were able to raise quite a bit of additional money because our product gained a lot of traction. And Microsoft, as the last of the three big cloud providers, uh, invested into Cilium and made it the, uh, the default for Azure as well. So we now have on AKS, Azure CNI powered by Cilium. So all three big cloud providers have at least one managed Kubernetes offering that now uses Cilium by default. So Microsoft joined investors such as Google, Cisco, A16C, and so on, which, which allowed us to continue development of Cilium, the open source product, and Isovalent Cilium Enterprise, the enterprise distribution that Isovalent offers. Last year was also the year when we introduced Tetragon, where we essentially moved beyond just the networking level and added runtime security and runtime observability in the form of Tetragon. So this allowed us to not only see the network layer end to end, it all of a sudden also allowed us to see into the applications and into the system. So this essentially added depth to the security solution we have. So instead of just seeing network observability, all of a sudden we're now also able to see system calls, file access, privilege escalations, and to a better extent, even network observability that is not accessible on the wire, but where you actually need to instrument the network stack as well. And it was not just observability, we also added the real-time runtime enforcement layer that allows to inject, inject policy rules to define what are things that an application is allowed to do and what are things they're not allowed to do. And in, and in particular, then Tetragon enforces those policies. You can run Tetragon completely separate. If you run it together with Cilium and Hubble, they all use data from each other and provide a better security posture overall. So this is the Tetragon offering. You may have seen this in the announcement last year, kind of all the things that Tetragon offers. A lot of visibility based on eBPF probes in the kernel with a lot of integrations in user space on how to actually expose this visibility to different uh, APIs, Prometheus metrics, Grafana, uh, SIM, of course, Fluentd, um, Elasticsearch, Open Telemetry, and so on. And then, of course, as well, the runtime enforcement when you can where you can define Kubernetes resource-based policies to, um, to define runtime policies. And by the way, if you are raising your hands, um, if please, please maybe um, write a message or the, the question into the chat and I will answer it there. Um, so yes, the question is, will this be recorded? Yes, this will be recorded uh, and we will make the recording available to everybody afterwards, of course. Couple of examples, what are things that Tetragon can provide? And this is really just a small little subset of all the different things that Tetragon, Tetragon, Tetragon can do from like network interface metrics to in, introspecting like the TLS use where we can see all the TLS handshakes and where are they going to, what TLS version, what cipher version. We can trace the entire network uh, level or kind of what, what network activity an application does. We can understand process execution, build process and system tree. That's what you see in the lower left. And then of course, file integrity monitoring. We can see every file access. We can see when file content changes and so on. So Tetracon, Tetracon can be a massive source of security uh, relevant observability data that you can use to better understand your system, your applications, understand threat models, and then of course, react to them as well. Of course, we always had fun. <laughs> this was the famous snow chain incident, Julia Pass in Switzerland. Part of the team decided, let's go early. We want to go skiing. Um, they got into a pretty severe snowstorm, so they had to mount uh, snow chains uh, on the 
on the on the mountain pass and you see a typical engineering setup here right two two engineers are trying to figure out how to put the snow chains on one engineer is checking youtube on how to actually do it and the fourth person is just taking a video that's a typical engineering setup right there so we keep coming back to the mounts. This is a picture of last year of the team, actually very close by to that original picture you saw in the in the in the first slide when we started the whole journey. Of course, by now the team has grown quite a bit. We continued kind of adding pieces to Cilium. So the next piece was the load balancer. So essentially to run Cilium as a load balancer in front of a Kubernetes cluster. So far, we have been able to do load balancing inside of the Kubernetes cluster or across clusters with the load balancer or the standalone load balancer outside. All of a sudden, you could run a psyllium based load balancer in front of the cluster and balance traffic across multiple clusters or do canary routing and so on. So that was great. Um, so whatever traffic that would come, let's say, from a smartphone or some IoT device or like a laptop, whatever, some incoming traffic into the cluster, you could now use uh, Cilium to do the load balancing and, of course, gain observability, network policy control, and so on. But we didn't stop there. We also added Timescape. So one big ask of all of our users was, you have all of this great observability data how do I store this over time? How do I make this persistent? I want to have this time machine and go back and look what happened two weeks ago or three hours ago. And I want to be able to do that across all the different platforms, no matter where Cilium runs. So we built Timescape or Hubble Timescape. It's a ClickHouse-based time series database where you can take all the observability data from the load balancer to the Cilium CNI, Hubble, Tetragon, all the pieces, whatever their observability data they produce, you can feed all of that into Timescape. And you can feed that from as many clusters as you want, or even from the standalone load balancers that are not running in Kubernetes at all, feed all of that in Timescape, and then run Hubble UI, the nice dashboards on top of that, or directly run analytics uh, queries on top of Timescape. So this gave both the, the network time machine, where you can go back and see what happened two weeks ago from a network perspective, but also analytics capabilities from a runtime um, run perspective. So you can go in and say, two days ago in this time period, what files did this pod access? Or did file content change? Or what was the network policy change that happened at this time at this timestamp? And so on. So you can store all of this very effectively in a time series database called Timescape based on ClickHouse. Question, why not use Grafana Mimir instead of Timescape since you partner with Grafana Labs? Great question. So first of all, yes, you can, of course, use Grafana Mimir as well. And that's fully compatible. It's a great solution. We actually started building Timescape a little bit earlier than we partnered when we announced the partnership with Grafana. The benefit of Timescape is that it actually understands the observability data schema. So it actually understands Hubble, Tetragon, uh, Cilium, CNI natively, which makes it more efficient from an analytics perspective. So if you go in and actually just want to have persistent flow logging, I think something like Grafana Mimir is awesome and great. If you want to run really complex analytics on security data, or if you have a lot of data and you want short query times, then Timescape with ClickHouse can be a bit more a bit more efficient. So that's the, the main trade off there is having something that is general purpose like Mimir or having something uh, ClickHouse based where we actually build Tetragon specific awareness into Timescape itself. That said, you can like top Timescape itself as a completely compatible uh, Hubble API. So you can actually run Prometheus metrics on it. You can run Grafana on Timescape. It's actually even better. We even built a Grafana plugin that you can use with the entire Grafana ecosystem and it queries directly from Timescape as well. Service Mesh, right? Last of the big innovation cycles, at least so far, a lot of our users said, great, I love the CNI layer. I love the observability. You can already operate at layer seven. Why are you not a service mesh? And we really struggle with these so-called sidecar proxies. Can you give us something that is better? Because up to this point, our answer to service mesh was go run Istio. We had an Istio integration that was functional and great. Many users running Istio on top of Cilium, and there was a better a better together story. So what more could we want? A lot of users said, please make it a little bit simpler. 
please remove those sidecars. Please just build that this build service mesh as a feature into Cilium. So that's what we did. Now you see why the kind of none of the picture part changes because service mesh is essentially just a feature that you can enable feature flag service mesh enabled, and you get a full blown service mesh as part of Cilium. In the first iteration, we primarily built layer seven load balancing and tracing because we already had the layer seven of our network policy. You see this on the left in the network security bracket. We already have network policy layer three to layer seven. We also already have encryption as well. So the main pieces missing in the first version were layer seven load balancing and HTTP tracing. So that's what we added in the first version that's fully available today. So you can use ingress, gateway API, or even just annotate Kubernetes services to perform layer seven load balancing. And you can easily just enable HTTP tracing and export that as metrics or open telemetry as well. No need to restart pods when service mesh is enabled. I would have to double check on that. I think it is possible without a restart because the Envoy proxy will be started on demand as needed. It, I think it will depend on whether your Cilium configuration disables Envoy. So if it, is, if it does disable Envoy, then you need to enable that and restart Cilium. If Envoy is configured to run on demand, then I think you don't need to restart anything at this part but probably best to uh, check in the Cilium Slack whether that's actually accurate or not. A service mesh control plane across clusters, is there a separate solution planned? Yes, we'll get to that. So that's one of the next steps in this service mesh offering. We're essentially right now piggybacking on Kubernetes, Kubernetes itself. So you can define Kubernetes ingress resources or gateway API, gate, gateway API resources but they are limited or there's scopes to one cluster. So it's on you to actually insert them into all the different clusters. That's what we have today. Can we get a link for the Cilium Slack? Very easy, go to Cilium.io. There is a big Slack button at the top. At the top. Click that to get access to the Cilium Slack. So this, this service mesh, what is actually then different? Like why did we actually build it in the end? Because there were a variety of service meshes already on the market at this point. The main difference is that we, first of all, we remove this sidecar proxy. So the need to run one proxy for each and every part. But then we can even go further. We can even run eBPF native. So no proxy whatsoever for a lot of the use cases. And for those use cases, essentially the, all of the, the logic, all of the data path implementation is all in eBPF in the kernel. So there is no need to redirect connections or to terminate connections or to run a proxy whatsoever. Everything on this slide, Cilium Service Mesh can do. Everything on the left, so of course, anything at layer three, layer four, canary, topology where routing, multi-cluster capability, network policy, and MTLS currently in beta, uh, as well as all of the observability, tracing, open telemetry metrics for HTTP, TLS, DNS, TCP, and UDP. All of that can be done in eBPF native. And then if we go to the right side, all of that is also supported. Layer seven load balancing, ingress, retries, layer seven rate limiting, TLS termination, TLS origination. So that those are the cases when Cilium does not control both sides. If you, con if you control both sides, both endpoints, of course, you can run MTLS. If we don't control both sides, then you need either terminus TLS termination if you only control the terminating side or origination if you only control the originating side. That's when we need a proxy as well as network policy. That's it. There is an asterisk there because that's actually something we will provide in eBPF relatively soon. I see another question. Do you know other eBPF-based runtime security solutions such as Obligo? What are your spe specificities? Um, so yes, I'm aware of all of them. Of course, also Falco and so on. The main difference is that Tetragon is very extreme in what it provides and implements in the, in the inside of the Linux kernel. So typical other approaches have a very a relatively minimalistic eBPF-based kernel-level probe, and it primarily just extracts visibility. And then the actual engine that will react based on that observability is in user space. And this leads to so-called reactive or asynchronous enforcement. Tetragon is different. It actually encodes all the enforcement logic or the vast, vast majority of that 
in the kernel so it can actually react in real time while threats are still ongoing. So it doesn't have to send events to user space and react in hindsight. It can react right when it sees activity in the kernel. And that is not only better from a real-time enforcement perspective, it also leads to more efficient observability because we can aggressively create histograms or metrics in the kernel instead of exporting a lot of raw data and then calculate metrics on top of that. We can provide a link to the Tatragon webinar that we did a couple of months back that goes all into the it goes into all the details of Tatragon. And then somebody already mentioned this. Yes, last year we also announced the partnership with Grafana, which is amazing. We already have um, several joint efforts that have been appearing so far, including, of course, the Grafana plugin for Cilium. And we are looking to integrate deeply with the Grafana ecosystem. I think this is really a match made in heaven. We understand eBPF very, very deeply. We are in a position where we can extract a lot of great observability data. And of course, Grafana has amazing experience, not just with metrics dashboards, but of course, also tracing, logging, and so on. Looking a little bit forward, what are we actually working on right now? And some of this is already has already come out in 1.13 that we released a couple of weeks back. And some of this is essentially will be part of 1.14 coming in, in coming this summer. We call this network security 2.0. And it's essentially the combination of service mesh and network security at the network level. Just adding MTLS is not good enough for us. We actually want to bring MTLS and authentication to network policies and network security. Service Mesh or the, 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 the advanced security principle of MTLS and mutual authentication should not be limited to workloads that are that where you can run a service mesh. It should really be applicable to all the endpoints. So we're bringing an MTLS model to the world of network policy where you can simply define Kubernetes network policies run spiffy and do authentication for what is allowed by your network policies applicable to all the network traffic. So no limitation, TCP only, IPv4 only, or something like this, applicable to all of the, all, to all of the network traffic. And of course, with the API gateway, we're bringing that to the load balancer. So you can essentially run layer seven load balancing, including gateway API uh, based routing, on the external or on the standalone load balancer as well. And with that, we are looking as a next step to then uh, get into a more centralized or an orchestrated control plane where we can do orchestration of policies, load balancing, and so on across multiple clusters. That said, we expect that um, a good amount of solutions will actually appear here where users will want to have a standardized way to, um, to control gateway API, regardless of what they're actually using underneath to then enforce or implement those policies. With that, that was the history of, of Cilium. I hope this was useful. I see we have at least one more question in the Q&A and I will get to it in a second. I want to leave you with a couple of uh, pointers first and then we'll have more time for questions. Um, of course, if you want to learn more about Cilium and Isovalent, of course, Cilium.io is your starting point for Cilium. It has lots of resources, isovalent.com resource in particular for all the interactive labs, uh, future webinars and so on. And of course, you can get in contact with us regarding the enterprise distribution if that is of interest. Um, those are the two main links to follow up to find more information. So let's go into the Q&A. Uh, I see a couple of questions already. Does Cilium have use cases in Web3 P2P networking? Uh, of course, you, even in those, I would say, advanced, uh, in advanced use cases, you still need fundamental networking. So yes, of course, you can use uh, Cilium directly. It is, in, in, in fact, very well aligned with the technology stack that you typically use for Web3 modern protocols, but there is nothing Web3 specific in Cilium, so there is no Web3 support or something like this. Um, Cilium provides generic modern networking that you can, of course, use to build Web3 or peer-to-peer -peer networking support. Next question, how much of development do you expect will occur to make Windows a first-class citizen or at least a valid endpoint for Cilium and the tooling around? 
Good question. We, we saw the first demo of Cilium um, in, at KubeCon in Valencia a year ago. And I think in particular, Microsoft is very eager to hear your feedback. What is the feature set? What is the functionality of Cilium? Is it Cilium? Is it Hubble? Is it Tetragon? What would you like to see on Windows? So the, 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 the eagerness is definitely there, in particular from the Microsoft side. If you are interested, feel free to reach out to us. I can make the connection to the Microsoft team uh, to have a deeper conversation on how to extend the supported set of functionality on Windows. And then the next question, are there plans for isovalent to develop a proxy for use cases that eBPF cannot manage? We are using the Envoy proxy for, so if we can do a certain functionality or if something is not possible in eBPF specifically, then we use the Envoy proxy, which is a CNCF project. And we're actually very happy with Envoy. Envoy is a very well-written proxy. It integrates really well with uh, Cilium. So really from that perspective, Cilium, whenever possible, uses eBPF directly. And then if it is not possible with eBPF yet, then we go back and use the Envoy proxy, which is typically a little bit, fa a bit, a little bit slower and it can add a bit more overhead. Um, but it, it's a good fallback option to have if we cannot do something natively in eBPF. And as we see demand for particular use cases, we will implement things whenever possible in eBPF. A good example of this is initial HTTP visibility was proxy-based with Envoy. We heard the demand from your users. You wanted to have a higher performing option. So we built something in eBPF and now we have an HTTP tracer natively in eBPF. Next question, is there a solution for Hubble to monitor multiple cube clusters? Yes, you can use Timescape for this. So Hubble itself has two modes. You can run Hubble to essentially export flow logs and metrics uh, on each node. And you can then feed all of that observability data into Timescape from as many clusters as you want. And you will simply see all the flow logs and the cluster name will be one metadata, just like the namespace label or the pod labels and so on. Or you can also run what's called Hubble Relay. Hubble Relay is essentially a solution where you don't need to have any storage. It will essentially create a mesh of all the nodes and you can query the nodes directly. This works quite well for smaller set of nodes. So let's say you have five, six clusters and only five nodes or 10 nodes per cluster. Relay can be quite effective and you can query in real time. Literally you can query and you will see flows in real time. As you scale up and if you're running hundreds of nodes, Relay becomes less optimal and you want to go towards Timescape with the downside that there is an in, there is a ingestion delay of a couple of seconds. But yes, you can do, and you have two options to do so. Next question. Can we configure service mesh across clusters as of today? What will be the central plane as of now? So yes, you can use service mesh across clusters. Right now there is um, cluster mesh, which essentially automates the connectivity across all the clusters, which then means you can easily run service mesh on top of that. It's one of the benefits that Cilium already has a multi-cluster control plane with identity distribution and so on, and the service mesh aspect can piggyback on that. But as far as things like injecting load balancing rules or, or policy, it is on you to, in, to, in, to inject that into all of the clusters. We have a variety of automation tools that we provide that automate the injection into all the clusters. But right now, we're not automatically propagating any sort of policies or load balancing rules and so on. If that's interesting to you, have a chat with us. We would love to hear what you want to see. It's definitely an area that we might be going into next. Next question. Elastic recently announced universal profiling using eBPF. Do you know how their solution compares to Cilium? Um, in general, Cilium and Hubble does not do a, a whole bunch of profiling. It's a use case that we have been excluding, excluding quite a bit. eBPF is amazing at profiling, and you may have seen things like CPU flame graphs or memory heat map graphics where you can see 
how much CPU is what function of my app using, where are the memory allocation spikes and so on. And that's all powered by eBPF and it's amazing. There's lots of different eBPF based profiling uh, projects like this and Elastic announced one more such project. Cilium does not, Cilium and Hubble do not do any sort of profiling whatsoever. There is a whole bunch of observability and telemetry data that you can extract, for example, with Tetragon, but it's usually not on the profiling side. It's usually more on the um, telemetry in terms of what is the latency, um, how many, how many, uh, how many IO accesses do I have? How many file system access do I have? It's less on the application profiling side. There is so many solutions out there already that we felt that there is no need to do to write yet another one uh, in the Cilium or Hubble ecosystem, at least, at least for now. Let me check the chat as well. Um, actually, it's just one more question that popped in. By dropping sidecars and having a single proxy at the node level, are we losing isolation at the pod level and start having issues such as noisy neighbors or potential security issues? It's a great question. There's a couple of different layers that apply to this. First of all, we strongly believe that the layer seven processing, so layer seven load balancing or HTTP tracing and so on, needs to be decoupled from the actual encryption. Unfortunately, HTTP is super complex to parse. So all the different proxy solutions out there, including Envoy and including, I'm not even going to name the others, like literally any proxy out there does have a pretty long history of CVs and vulnerabilities related to HTTP processing. And any flaw in the proxy would, would therefore also expose secrets, uh, keys, certificates that are managed by the proxy. And that's true both for the sidecar as well as for the Perno proxy. If you're using sidecars, of course, the leak is less because you only manage the certificate of your own service. If you use a shared proxy, the proxy will have access to all the certificates on that node. But by separating the MTLS proxy or MTLS layer or the encryption layer from the layer seven proxy, this risk is mitigated entirely. And that's the first big step. So that's why um, Cilium Service Mesh essentially separates the MTLS path or the MTLS encryption and the kernel level encryption from the layer seven proxy. This already mitigates the majority of the security risk. What then remains is the noisy neighbor. And the noisy neighbor problem exists regardless of whether we have a shared proxy or we isolate. If we have a sidecar, yes, you can, let's say, dedicate one virtual CPU per sidecar, but that doesn't actually really solve the problem because you will still, still have finite resources at the node level, just further down. Yes, your proxy may not starve others, but the, the network resources available and the total CPU resources available will still be the same. So typically you will have to guess how much CPU resources your proxy needs and you have to kind of worst case guess. This essentially leads, leads to this service mess where you need to dedicate a lot of compute for the worst case that your proxy may end up using actually a lot more beneficial to have a shared node proxy where we can do fair queuing and, and decide which requests are more important. In fact, that's what Linux, the Linux kernel does. If you have containers running all on the same node, they all share the same Linux kernel or the same, the same, the same operating system. And that actually brought a lot of benefits in terms of bin packing, efficiency, and so on, as well as fair queuing. Um, and we want to bring that to service mesh as well. I know that was a technical and long answer. I hope it made sense to you. Happy to chat further on this specific topic, of course. Next question. Are the features discussed part of enterprise version or the free version? All the features I covered today, except for Timescape, are in the open source version. Both Cilium and Tetragon, they have in an open source, which is what you find in the Cilium repository in the Tetragon repository, an open source version. And they then have an enterprise version from Isovalent. That's the version we provide support on. Right now, Timescape is the only component where we do not have an open source version for it yet. So everything you've seen today, except for the last Timescape piece, that persistent storage, is available in open source. And let me check the chat whether we have 
Uh, and if, if you have a question and I have not answered it, it may be good to ask it again. I will go from bottoms up. Um, I see Torben regarding network policies. Is it possible to define guardrail network policies managed by security team and developers should not have should not be able to overrule that? Yes, you can do this. So you can do so-called cluster-wide policies or admin policies, and they are subject to a to different RBAC rules. So you can give access to the namespace level rules to your app teams, even only for particular namespaces, and your app teams can define them. And then you as a security team, you only have access, you're the only entity who has access to the cluster while or admin level policies, and they can override. They can allow something that should never be a, that should never be never be denied, and they can also deny destination and sources. And no matter what the application team does, you cannot overrule that deny. So yes, you can essentially build hierarchy for let's say SecOps teams and app teams. We also have in Hubble UI what's called RBAC, so the ability to expose the visibility, the dashboards the network policy editor, all of that, and only limit access or limit the access to only certain namespaces or only parts with certain, with certain labels. So you can even restrict the observability, observability data to a subset of resources in your cluster if you have multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters. When do you expect cluster mesh to be out of beta? I think that should be out of beta. Let me check. That's actually a great question. The cluster mesh is definitely fully production ready. Many, many customers are using that in, in, in production. If that's still more better, then that's a mistake in the documentation. We have been uh, marking cluster mesh stable a while ago. Will this video be posted to YouTube? Yes. Does Cilium already have solutions for transparent web proxy handling? So to force egress traffic transparently via forwarding proxy? Yes, we can do this. We have a special feature in Cilium network policy where you can define a network policy and you can force all the traffic through an external proxy. So not only the Cilium Envoy proxy, but for example, also a Cloudflare proxy. We can even feed TCP traffic over an HTTP proxy as well. You can talk to us to get more details on this use case. So definitely uh, fully possible. We also have what's called the egress gateway where you can force all egress traffic of certain, part, port, certain parts through a particular node. So let's say you want to run a transparent proxy squid or something on that node. You can force all the egress traffic of your cluster through that node and then run API or squid proxy or whatever uh, inspection uh, tool you want to run there. Let me see if any more questions. What, what are the features planned for the next year? Uh, definitely a ton of stuff, um, including, of course, the next iteration of Service Mesh. A lot of Tetragon functionality that is coming, including the, uh, the much thought after Falco rule converter that we are working on. And we might have an exciting announcement for KubeCon to do a bit more networking outside of Kubernetes as well, but I won't, don't want to spoil all the details. We will announce that uh, during KubeCon Amsterdam in a couple of weeks. Let me just check q and I see there are three more questions. Are there any use cases of Cilium which uses HBPF, eBPF in hardware? Yes, um, you can. All the SmartNIC providers do offer eBPF support. And they can offload some functionality of Cilium to the SmartNIC. The two most common questions or two most common features that are offloadable are the load balancer, the standalone load balancer, and the DDoS protection. The DDoS protection is the ability to define long lists of IPs or IP blocks that you do not want to receive traffic from. So you can, for example, block entire regional IP blocks to protect your, your, your infrastructure. So let's say you're under a DDoS attack and you can isolate the set of IPs where the DDoS attack is coming from. You can, black, you can block them in Cilium and it can enforce, it can push down these rules into the SmartNIC to essentially drop packets even more, even more effectively. And that way your server servers will remain and stay, stay alive as long as they have enough raw network bandwidth from a wire from a wire perspective. Then do you have a public roadmap for planned functionality? Yes. 
we have a roadmap. You can go to uh, Cilium.io and click on documentation or just go into the Cilium documentation. And if you search for roadmap, you will find the roadmap, um, that kind of the high level roadmap. What are we planning to stabilize next? What are the bigger pocket items that are coming? And of course, all the features that we're working on, all the small little bug fixes, enhancement, all of them are tracked in GitHub as issues. There's several hundred of them where you can see what are we actually working on and what kind of how these features will look like. If you look for the higher level roadmap, that is part of the Cilium documentation. Great. Um, I think I hopefully I answered all the questions. If you have more questions, feel free to join the Cilium Slack. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, on Slack, wherever you can find me. I'm happy to answer more questions. Or if I don't know the answer, I will refer you to the right person. Again, I want to thank everybody for um, attending today. I hope this was useful. And I would love to see many of you uh, as part of the Cilium Slack. Uh, in the next couple of days. Thanks a lot, everybody.